This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. On May 12, 1982, the body of a young Minnesota housewife washed up on the shore of Lake Superior. Her husband, Larry Race, was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. To this day, Race maintains his innocence, and his dead wife's parents support his claim. Is Larry Race guilty or innocent? Helen Rose Myron grew up on the Long Plain Reservation in Manitoba, Canada. In 1941, Helen Rose was banished by her father when she joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Heartbroken, she vanished. Her family has not seen her in nearly 50 years. Also thanks to our viewers, a man charged with murdering his wife is now in custody, following a dramatic shootout with police. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Lake Superior, headwater of the Great Lakes, the largest freshwater lake in the world. The water temperature hovers near freezing for most of the year. A person adrift without a life raft stands little chance of survival. On May 12, 1982, the lake claimed another victim, 33-year-old Debbie Race. Her life jacket was intact. She had not drowned. Debbie Race had succumbed to the icy lake temperatures and died of hypothermia. According to the authorities, Debbie Race's death was no accident. Her husband, Larry Race, was accused of deliberately allowing her to freeze to death in Lake Superior. He was subsequently convicted of murder. Yet Debbie's own parents believed that Larry could not possibly have harmed their daughter. After eight agonizing years and five unsuccessful post-trial reviews, this is the final appeal of Larry Race. Larry Race is currently serving a life sentence at Stillwater State Prison in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He maintains that the jury which convicted him was prejudiced because he had a long history of adulterous relationships. What happened that night was an accident. I didn't kill Debbie. Yes, I was unfaithful. But I had nothing to do with her death on that night. Um, adultery, yes, I'm guilty for that. Sorry for it, I, I'm extremely sorry. Debbie and Larry Race, along with her three children, lived in Hoyt Lakes, Minnesota, 75 miles from Lake Superior. Larry's hobbies were boating and scuba diving. Debbie built her world around her home and her children. Over the years, Larry and Debbie's marriage suffered badly because of his affairs. But by 1982, Larry says they had vowed to try again. May 11th of 1982 was Larry and Debbie's 14th wedding anniversary. To celebrate, they had dinner at a Lakeview restaurant and took their boat named the Jenny Lee after their daughters on a Lake Superior for an evening cruise. It felt as if things were starting over again. Things, we had a, like a, a renewed spirit. Um, I, I wanted to stop what I was doing. And uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe this is the chance. Um, you know, I have a, a, a wonderful woman here. There's nothing wrong with her. And, uh, and I wanted to take an about face. After darkness fell, Larry and Debbie drifted contentedly. 
They stayed about one mile offshore, enjoying the view of the city lights and listening to tapes of their favorite music. Tape over. Or do you want to listen to another one? No, that's good. All right. Suddenly at 9 p.m., the mood was broken. Debbie noticed that the boat was taking on water. Larry, there is water all over the bow of the boat. Where's that coming from, honey? Larry says Debbie began to panic. She had no faith in the Jenny Lee because it had nearly sunk the summer before. As soon as we pulled the cover off the engine, we noticed there was water spraying all over the place. So we shut the engine down, took the alternator, loosened up the bolt, and dropped the alternator. As soon as we dropped the alternator, shut the engine down, the water leakage stopped. Is that going to hold? I think it'll work. I'm going to have to tape it, though. Things were pretty well under control until then. We worked together to get the boat fixed. We worked together to get the, the water stopped, and everything was OK. Nothing, we didn't feel in danger. We had a light on. Uh, nothing, nothing was bad then. Can you cut this tape right here? Once we got all the repairs done, Debbie went to start the engine. Larry, it won't start. Did you turn it over one more time? Well, I figured she just didn't know how to start it, right? So I went to start it. I can't get it to start. Let me get in there. I made it to almost a battery was uh, uh, dead. We had two batteries on, on the boat. And it wouldn't start for me either. So now we're both back by the engine, wondering why it won't start. There must be something I'm missing here. Oh, oh, oh Larry was thinking, I want to get off the boat now. Larry. The fear came no, to both of us when we heard that gushing and that whooshing noise from the bottom of the boat. Uh, I, I mean, I was scared along with her. She made me scared. No, I didn't know how to, I wasn't thinking right. I didn't, I didn't listen to what I, what I should have done. I made poor judgments. I, I listened to what she said, get off the boat. Okay, crack the valve on this when I get it together. Okay, tell me when you're ready. I got First it. thing we did was um, pull the life raft out to, to get it blown up. We always carry um, a scuba tank on the board for that purpose. Larry, there's holes in it. It's, it's not holding air. We can't use this. So we tossed that one aside and got the second one, and we filled that one up the same way we started the first one. And that was filled. It worked fine. No more. Even though these are two-man rafts, there's only room for one person in that boat. Okay. So you're going to get in here, and I'm going to drag us to shore, OK? All right. OK. OK, I'm going to put my purse in the bag. Give me Debbie your shoes. put her okay. purse and other valuables, as well as Larry's shoes, into a gear bag. Yes. She took the bag and a scuba tank with her in the life raft. Larry Race had his dry suit and scuba tanks on board. He was a strong swimmer and thought he could tow Debbie and the raft to safety. He had done the same thing with his daughters when the Jenny Lee had run into trouble before. I knew I had to push her to shore, and I knew I could. I was strong enough, and she said the same thing. She said, Larry, you're strong enough. You can do it. And I pushed, and I pushed, and I was making it. I was, it was OK, but I started getting cold. I can't hold on. I gotta come in. My hands are freezing. I can't hold on. I need to get to the boat. All right. No! No! No, Larry! The water's coming in! No! Don't come in! You can't come in! No. Okay. She was terrified. And at that time, I knew I couldn't get in the raft. And uh, I thought that, you know, I would die. And uh, at that time, I, I made a poor judgment. Um, I looked off to the right, and there was lights coming. I said, I'll go for help. There's a light out there. I, I think I could get to it. I'll the lights it. were closer the than we were swimming ashore. Debbie was going that way towards shore. I was going the opposite way for help. One of us were going to get help. One of us were going to get to shore. Debbie was going to get to shore for help, or I was going to get to the boat for help. One of us were going to get somebody to help. The light Larry Race had seen was his own boat. This time, the engine started. After catching his breath, he would search for Debbie, all the while firing distress flares. In the end, Larry would return to shore and notify the Coast Guard. They would conduct a grid search of the lake to no avail. The next afternoon, a teenager on his way home from school saw Debbie Race's body on the lake shore. Larry Race was charged with murder. At his trial, 
Larry Race's attorneys advise him not to take the stand on his own behalf. After he was convicted, Larry hired a new team of lawyers, insisting that he'd been the victim of incompetent counsel. Larry Race believes that if he had testified, the jury would not have found him guilty. The prosecuting attorney at Larry Race's trial was John DeSanto of Duluth, Minnesota. Even though the case against Larry was circumstantial, DeSanto was able to convince a jury that Larry Race had the opportunity, means, and motive to murder his wife. I have absolutely no doubt that Larry Race is guilty of first-degree murder. And that's why I believe that this is not an appropriate case for unsolved mysteries. It simply is not an unsolved mystery. I believe the evidence showed that uh, he wanted out of an unhappy marriage at this time in his life. And uh, at the same time, he had $108,000 of life insurance on her life in place that he had purchased within the seven months previous to her death uh, through credit life insurance. Part of it, about $37,000, was mortgage insurance that came along with the mortgage on his house. The rest of it came as part of a group policy from his uh, credit union. And there was some testimony, in fact, that Debbie had been the one to seek out this additional insurance coverage. Larry, you won't start! Larry Race's defense was built around his story of mechanical problems in the Jenny Lee. The prosecution claimed Larry concocted the entire episode. After his trial, the Jenny Lee was sold an independent mechanic examined the starter. The mechanic said that it was worn and that the type of problem that he saw there would cause an intermittent starting failure, that the, that the engine on some occasions would not start. At one of Larry Race's post-conviction hearings following the trial, a man did come forward and testify that he had found a starter problem in the Jenny Lee in uh, late May or early June of 1984, or two years after Debbie's death, the night of May 11th and 12th of 82. He simply could not say that this was a problem he, uh, that, that was on the boat the night of uh, Deborah Race's death. And therefore, it was ruled uh, irrelevant, both in the trial court and ultimately in the uh, appellate courts. It's, look, it's losing air. There's holes. No, we can't use this. Larry Race is adamant that he had two life rafts on board the Jenny Lee. Well, the evidence clearly showed there was but one raft on the Jenny Lee the night of May 11th and 12th of 1982. Uh, Every one of Larry Race's diving companions or friends or both that testified at the trial said that they had never seen him in possession of two blue and yellow rafts, as he claims. And also as significant is the fact that the search and rescue people from the Coast Guard said that if that raft had existed, they would have found it. We've got, uh, we don't have a radio. At Larry I've Race's trial, a deputy a sheriff testified that Larry had told him there were right two we life rafts on board. Right now. Uh, I didn't hear you uh, mention any noisemakers of any sort. No, we, we don't have a noisemaker, but we do have two rafts. Uh, I just got another raft. This deputy testified that Larry specifically told him, quote, what about rafts? I have two. That deputy testified about that happening over two weeks beforehand. Well, it sounds like you've got just about everything. Yeah. Well, the prosecution like points out that the deputy's the testimony was inconsistent. When he was first questioned, 11 yeah, days after so Debbie Race's death, exactly. he said he knew nothing about no, two rafts. Rafts would definitely help, yeah. The prosecution claims that Larry pushed Debbie in the raft well away from the Jenny Lee, then returned to the boat and donned his scuba equipment. They say Larry swam back under Debbie's raft and slashed it with a knife, leaving her to freeze to death in the icy waters. This was very significant evidence at the trial, and it was that there were five punctures or cuts in the bottom of the raft placed in, in the raft while it was inflated because, as the experts testified, there was no uh, knife cut on the top of the raft that would correspond with the bottom puncture, meaning the, the air chambers were uh, inflated, and strategically placed in that they cut both 
air chambers. It wasn't a random thing like vandalism where someone who isn't really intent on cutting both air chambers but just damaging a piece of property. They were placed in both air chambers from the bottom while the raft was inflated. The prosecution failed to produce the knife used to cut the raft. The puncture marks did not match the only knife found on board the Jenny Lee. The prosecution asserts that once Debbie had been set adrift, Larry dragged the life raft back to the Jenny Lee so he would have support for his story about attempting to inflate a first raft. All of the events that leads to the action of Larry, according to the prosecution, required superhuman effort, super feet that were not just physically possible. Witnesses placed the Jenny Lee here near the mouth of the Talmadge River at 8.30 p.m. and again at 9.30. Debbie's body was found here, seven miles away. According to Jean Aubineau, it would have been impossible for a body to drift that far without a raft. If she had been in the water with a parka, with a life vest, she can only travel one to two miles and will hit shore somewhere. The only way she could have landed seven miles down was on a raft. The fact that we just don't know where the Jenny Lee was on the lake at the time he persuaded, uh, at the time Larry Race persuaded Debbie to leave it, uh, makes it impossible to then start with a drift theory that would put her uh, body at such and such a place, uh, whether she's in a raft or without a raft because we, again, don't have a precise starting point. We never did have one, and that's what makes it so difficult to give any credibility to the Abano uh, drift theory that was presented by the defense. According to Larry Race's attorneys, the skin lividity in Debbie's body also proves that she came ashore in a life raft. Debbie's blood had not sunk to her feet. They claim it would have done so if she'd been kept afloat in an upright position by a life vest. The lividity of Deb Debbie Race's blood following her death was to the back. Uh, and that was consistent, or is consistent, with the fact that she floated in the water with that life jacket without a raft available to her. Because as the expert testified at trial, this particular life jacket would have kept her basically uh, face up uh, on her back as she floated uh, after following her death. Her body, of course, was then found face up on its back on the, on the shore of Lake Superior as well, which would continue the, the lividity to her back. And the autopsy uh, report clearly indicates the lividity was to her back. After hearing all the evidence, but without hearing from Larry Race himself, a jury of four men and eight women found him guilty of murder. I couldn't believe it because there was no hard, cold evidence, hard facts. There wasn't anything. It was all circumstantial. There was nothing concrete about his case at all, except he had his affairs. It's hard to take, you know, when so many people think he was guilty, but it's never been a problem with us. We just don't believe he was guilty. If you only knew Larry, you wouldn't think that Larry would ever do anything like that. Today, I'm, I'm angry at the fact that he was able to convince 12 jury members that this happened without, without any facts, without any evidence. He just says, we think Larry did it. We want him convicted. And that's what he did. In 1981, 17-year-old Annette Schopacher fell in love with Jim Burnside, a butcher at the grocery store where Annette worked. Have a good evening. A year later, the couple married. The bride was just 18, the groom 46. For Annette, the marriage marked the beginning of a nightmare. 
She became afraid of him almost immediately because he was jealous of her, and when he was drinking, he was violent and and made remarks to her all the time that uh, she would never ever leave him. That uh, well, he he started telling her right from the beginning that he would kill her if she ever tried to leave him. In 1987, after five years of nearly constant emotional and physical abuse, Annette finally found the courage to leave Jim. Two months later, Jim Burnside brutally attacked Annette and one of her co-workers. Hey, get over here. What are you doing? Annette's co-worker survived the attack. Annette had been stabbed 15 times with a butcher knife and was pronounced dead at the scene. That afternoon, Jim Burnside disappeared. It's bad enough knowing that Annette had to die, but to know that he is still out there, it, it's horrible. We just want him caught, and I just hope and pray that somebody spots him. Update. The night this story aired, two viewers contacted our telecenter to report that Jim Burnside was living in Shelby County, Alabama, under the assumed name Al Wilson. When I saw his actual picture, I just looked at my husband and I just started pointing and I'm going, you know, tell me my eyes aren't deceiving me. You know, that is Al. And he goes, yes, that's Al. The first thing I thought is that, well, hey, you know, let, let's call up the authorities and get this guy off the street. Burnside was employed as a carpenter at the 280 flea market just outside of Chelsea, Alabama. Uh, we had received a call from the FBI office in Birmingham stating that uh, they felt pretty sure that James Burnside would be at this flea market on Highway 280 located in Shelby County. The morning after our broadcast, FBI agents and sheriff's deputies checked out the flea market. You got a fellow hanging around here by the name of Al Wilson? Yeah, he's right there on the roof. And apparently Burnside saw them and uh, went towards his truck. There he is. FBI, hold it. FBI, hold it. The fugitive drew a 357 Magnum and pointed it at the officers. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Burnside was struck by two bullets. He was placed under arrest and taken to a Birmingham hospital. From what we've been able to determine, and again talking to his co-workers, he had made a statement on Thursday morning that he had anticipated having problems that day. So apparently he had viewed the um, Unsolved Mysteries himself Wednesday night. On April 1st, 1988, Jeannie Tovery, a wealthy socialite from Phoenix, Arizona, was murdered in her own bed while she slept. At the time of her death, she was worth several million dollars, most of it inherited from her late husband. But Jeannie Tovery's origins were humble. Jeannie was born in a small Arkansas farming community and married fresh out of high school. In 1953, her marriage failed and Jeannie eventually wound up in Phoenix working as a cocktail waitress. If you folks need anything, I'll be sitting right over there. Jeannie had no intention of spending her life waiting tables. On her rest breaks, she studied real estate law, determined to make a better life for herself. Several years later, Jeannie was well on her way. She had obtained her real estate license in 1970 and become an immediate success. 
1971, one of Jeannie's clients introduced her to Edward Tovery, a charming, wealthy divorcee. Jean's the one that helped us on that real estate deal I was telling you about. She did a great job oh, really? for us. Well, congratulations. That was super. Thanks. You're embarrassing me. Never be embarrassed when somebody tells you you've done something well. It's part of the business. And I think you're going to do well because of your people skills. I bet you're good at Ed had all the qualities that Jean was looking for. I'd like to propose a toast. It's just that simple. To old friends and to new friendships. You have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the prince. And she considered Ed a prince. Ed Tovery embarked on an intense courtship, and Jeannie was swept off her feet. Ed's ancestors had made millions in the cattle business and were among the founding fathers of Phoenix. But Ed Tovery made his own name as a pilot in World War II. He was shot down and taken as a prisoner of war by the Germans. Ed helped engineer the famous Great Escape, digging tunnels which allowed 79 other POWs to go free. Less than a year after they met, Jeannie and Ed were married in a private ceremony in Hawaii. Jeannie became an instant hit with the Phoenix upper crust. She seemed to fall right into it, as if though she'd had that money forever. She was welcomed and very, very well loved, extremely liked. I don't know of one, and I can honestly say this, I don't know one person that disliked Jeannie. She was just one of those very special people with very special qualities. She treated people like she wanted to be treated. I never saw any airs with Jean. They entertained a lot, very casual, entertaining, had friends in. They had a very good marriage. They both liked to do the same things. But there was one cloud darkening Jeannie and Ed's life together. Respiratory oh, problems had plagued Ed ever since his POW days. By 1982, he was virtually bedridden, and Jeannie nursed him around the clock. Yeah, how about a little soup? Jeannie, I think it's about time we talked about what you're going to do after I'm gone. Aunt, please don't talk that way. I just want to make sure you're taken care of, that you get the house, and you're comfortable. OK? OK. Jean was not a greedy person. Uh, it wasn't like, well, I. I have married you, everything you have is mine. This was not Jane. On July 11th, 1983, Ed Tovery died. He left Jeannie an estate worth millions, including the house and a valuable art collection. It was hard for her to visualize life without him because he was her steadying factor. I think it was scary for her. After a period of mourning, Jeannie threw herself back into the Phoenix social world. I think it was her way to get over everything and meet people. Became quite the, the socialite and uh, chaired many of the balls and her circle of friends all went. So it became a very, uh, for Jeannie, it became a, a, a way of doing things uh, for herself. Well, I'm gonna finish these last few invitations and call it a night. The right, evening of March 31st, 1988, Bye. found Jeannie Tovery preparing the final few invitations for yet another high society party. At 7 p.m., she spoke with her sister. By 1 a.m. the next day, she would be dead. She had mailed those invitations, and then they came right after we found out that she had been murdered. And it did do a number on all of us. Uh, it was almost like, remember my party. Uh, it was very spooky. I wonder if you did that before or after uh, you killed him. At the murder scene, police found several fingerprints, but little other physical evidence. Jeannie's purse, along with her identification and credit cards, were missing. Uh, jewelry case, too. Ernie, do you want to move the pillow? Sure. Those credit cards have never been found, and they've never been used to this day. The fingerprints that we have have been compared to every name that's been mentioned to us has been through our computer system, and we have not identified who those prints belong to. My opinion and that opinion of two detectives all felt that she was the victim of a hit. She was killed intentionally for somebody.
Police theorized that the killer was familiar with Jeannie's neighborhood because he had so easily gained access to her home. I would say the suspect at least had some knowledge of the house. The entry into the house was made through a window, but it was done in a manner not to set the alarm system off. There's white carpeting throughout the house, and there was no indications in any room except her bedroom that anybody had been in there. It appears that he knew the direct path from the point of entry to her bedroom and where she was. She was shot while she lay in bed asleep. There was no obvious signs of a struggle. Police believe that the killer scattered Jeannie's costume jewelry simply to give the appearance of a burglary attempt. He left thousands of dollars worth of real jewelry untouched in the next room. Also, it seemed that he wanted someone to be alerted. The alarm was set off when the sliding door was opened by the suspect. He could have went out the same way he got in without ever setting the alarm off. It's only a theory, but one of the reasons we considered is that this person, if he was paid to kill her, wanted to let the person who paid him know that the job was done. Who could have wanted Jeannie Tovery dead? Police were at a loss until they were given the old tapes from her answering machine. That was when they heard the voice of a mysterious man who called himself Gordon Phillips. And I will try and call back this afternoon, and I have some information for you. It's a beautiful place you have here. In 1987, Phillips, who claimed to be a magazine writer, had tried to interview Jeannie about her late husband's POW experiences. How may I help you? Well, as I told you on the phone, I'm writing a book about prisoners of war. I'd like to talk to you specifically about your husband, Ed. Well, you know, that was a very long time ago. I, I'm not that familiar with Ed's past. Well, surely he must have said something to you about his uh, POW experience. I mean, that was a, a big part of his life. He didn't like to dwell in the past. You know, you'd be better off talking to the first Mrs. Tover. Tell me something about Ed himself, your husband, the man. What was he like? Mr. Phillips, you say you work for a time life. Yes. Well, then, of course, you would have some identification you could show me. Well, actually, I'm a freelance writer. I'm not really on staff. Uh, I can provide you with some references. You know, I'm going to have to cut you short. I have a plane to catch in the morning and a lot of... Gene had him checked out. And Time Magazine had never heard of him. And Gene once again told him that she was the wrong person to talk to. As she couldn't seem to make him understand this. Gordon Phillips continued to hound Jeannie Tovery by phone. If she was not in, he left messages on her machine. And Jeannie became certain that Phillips was following her. Mr. Phillips, I told you I do not want to meet with you. Maybe she'd be at a party or out shopping or something, and she'd think she saw this guy. For a while there, it was every time she went somewhere, she would see him. He never came up to her but uh, she would see him in a crowd. And she was extremely nervous about this. This is Jeannie, this is Gordon Phillips checking back. It's about 3.30, I will try back around five o'clock. Thank you. Police still have no idea who Gordon Phillips is, where he has gone, or whether he was involved in the murder of Jeannie Tovery. My greatest fear is that I'll never know why. It's inconceivable to me that Jean was murdered. This happens to other people. It's what you read in the newspaper. It doesn't happen to my family. I miss her. She was my sister. She was my best friend. She was mine, and she didn't deserve to die.
When we return, the saga of a young Indian woman who ran off to join the Air Force and never came home. In Manitoba, Canada, just across the North Dakota border, is a family called the Myron Clan. They are part of the Plains Ojibwe Indian Nation. In the 1940s, the Myrons found themselves caught between the global politics of the Second World War and the deeply rooted traditions of the Ojibwe. There were seven children in the Myron family. The youngest girl, Helen Rose, was just six months old when this picture was taken in 1925. Her family has not seen her for more than half a century. It's been going on too long. We've missed her too long. Too many years have gone by. And we'd like to find her now. No matter where she is, we still love her. And we're all concerned about her. When the Myron children were growing up, they spent the winter months at a government boarding school. Every summer, they came home to their parents' log cabin on the Ojibwe reservation. Helen Rose, come and sit beside me. In September of 1932, the children prepared to return to school, even though their mother was gravely ill. I might not be here when you return from school. Be a good girl and make me proud of you. I will. Bye. A month later, Archie Myron showed up at his children's school, unannounced. When your children left last summer, your mother was very sick. So our dad came left, and told us that our mother had passed brother. away. And uh, she died there two days ago. Right away I saw what it was going to do to her. Helen Rose! All of the children were devastated, especially Helen Rose. Always her mother's favorite, she would never fully recover from the death. By 1941, Helen Rose was in her junior year at the boarding school. She was 17, and the world had become a very different place. Right now, as I'm speaking, the German hordes are marching across Europe, causing havoc, destruction, and death. It's only a matter Hitler's of armies were threatening to overrun the globe. The new principal at the boarding school was actively interventionist, and Helen Rose became swept up in the anti-fascist fervor. You know I've talked to you about joining the reserves. This is your opportunity to join the world that really matters. He was teaching them the role of the other society. And I presume that that's where Helen got her idea to better her life with the outside world and uh, to join the Air Force. Helen Rose dropped out of high school. In an unprecedented move for an Ojibwe woman, she enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force. When they discovered that Helen Rose was underage, the Air Force ordered her to obtain her father's permission. Helen Rose returned to the reservation in July. As a tribal elder, Archie Myron was helping preside over the annual sun or thirsting dance when the Plains Ojibwe erect traditional structures and offer prayers to the Great Spirit. You want to talk to I would like for you to sign. She had papers, and she asked my dad to sign those papers. What is this paper? Uh, it's to join the Canadian Armed Forces. I don't think I want you to join the Air Force, my daughter. Why not? And he told her, but I don't want you to die someplace else. And if you go to war, you may not come back. So he didn't sign those papers. Then Helen Rose got mad. Said he'll never see me again. Get someone else to sign it for me or something. Friends and relatives, she would have been proud to see Helen in the Air Force. 
I often think now, if he had consented to signing his name on there, this would have been far different. We would have, I'm sure that we would have had Helen Rose with us here all this time yet. Helen Rose did not return to her father's cabin. She spent the night with an aunt. The next morning, she said her last goodbyes. You take care of yourself, and I'm gonna miss you. Yeah, I'm gonna miss you too. When she was leaving her auntie's place, she told her auntie, well, I'm leaving now, and you'll never see me again. I'm not ever coming back. Well, take care, okay? She was very disappointed. She wasn't actually mad, but she was disappointed when she didn't get that signature. Two years later, Helen Rose did return to the area. And where are you stationed, miss? When Angus Merrick walked into the general store, 15 miles from the reservation, he was shocked to see his sister-in-law. Helen Rose. Angus, nice to see you. Helen Rose, how you been doing? Oh, I'm fine. She had her uniform on, and oh, she looked good. Oh, thank you. I said, your father is just across the street here. I'll go and get him. Oh, he will maybe to want to see you, too. Just wait for a while. I'll be right back, OK? Just, it won't take long. So I went over and told uh, Archie that uh, his daughter, Helen, was there. and. Uh, I asked him, if you would, would you like to come? And without hesitation, he came right away. By the time we got to the store, I couldn't find Helen. She disappeared. She really was here. Sixteen years later, Archie Myron died without ever having made peace with his youngest daughter. Each year, Archie Myron's family gathers at the cemetery to honor the entire Myron clan with an Ojibwe ceremony. The extended family now numbers 150, and still they long for the return of Helen Rose. Even if she has passed away, her family wants to know so that Helen Rose's spirit can be honored in accordance with the Ojibwe tradition. I don't know what's keeping her away. Surely she cannot hold a grudge this long. We have no part in it. Just between her and my dad, not us. She said she wasn't going to come back, and she has stuck to her word, true like a real Indian woman. Join me next week for another edition of Unsolved Mystery. Thank you.